Hello. Uh, I haven't actually been to any um, second-hand shops for a while. I was trying to think last night uh, when I was in bed going to sleep, when was the last time I, um, I bought something? And sometimes that can feel uh, longer than it is. Um, certainly over a month. Um, maybe even longer than that. But anyway, today I paid a visit to the local store. And when I talk about it a lot, that's kind of about five minutes walk from my house. And I pass on the way to the supermarket. And so I called in. And you know, when I first walked in, this is a problem I often have. When I first walked in, um, the CD shelf section in the second hand shop, it's a Salvation Army charity op shop, second hand shop, Goodwill store, whatever you want to call it. It's quite a narrow area. And so really only one person at a time can really peruse that area of the store. And so um, usually, typically it's empty, that area of the store. It's quite a big store. But this time there was some guy looking. So um, usually I'll hang around nearby, like in the book section for a couple of minutes until maybe they'll leave. But I thought, I don't want to do that. So I went down and did my shopping I had to go to the pharmacy and a few other places. And then on the way back, I went back in, and this time it was empty, so I had a look. And I found a few things. You can see the top one there is this Outcast. Now, I'm not sure exactly what it is. It's not an album. I think it's kind of like a compilation. Uh, maybe not a, a greatest hits, but I, um, I don't know. Because I saw on this there are songs from... Um, was it Stanconia? So let's have a look inside, it might say. So we got the album from 94, Southern Player Listica Lacca Music. And then at ATL, was it ATLians? ATLians? Like they're from Atlanta, so Atlanta and aliens together. Um, and then I guess at the back we've got the other albums, maybe. Aquimini and Stanconia. Um, now at one stage I owned both of those albums, Aquamini and Sanconia, and also the Love Below speaker box, which I still have. I got that secondhand over the last, a few years ago, but I had that. I owned all of those new about 20-ish years ago because I quite like Outkast. As far as kind of hip-hop goes, um, I, I, you know, I do. I like them. Um, so I think this is a... Is it kind of like a, a compilation, almost greatest hits type thing from their first four albums? So for the first, for the past seven years, Outcast has been traversing da, 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 the sophomore da, da, on their first. I'm trying to see if it just says what this is. According to the history, regarded. Okay, it doesn't say, but I know, for example, that Miss Jackson is from Stanconia and. Bombs Over Baghdad is from Stanconia as well. And I think, uh, well, there it is. Say uh, That one, Southern Player, blah, blah, that's from their first album. And um, <coughs> Aquamini, obviously, <coughs> is from Aquamini. <coughs> and what's the other one? Oh, So Fresh and So Clean, that's from um, Aquamini as well, I'm pretty sure. So yes, it looks like it's a kind of a compilation introduction to them um, pre the Love Below uh, speaker box. But it also has, and this is the main reason I got this, the song, The Whole World. Now I'm pretty sure The Whole World, actually I should have looked at that, that is not from those original albums. That was kind of put on here as a bonus song. Um, I could be wrong, but I quite like that song as well, The Whole World. It's got Killer Mike, um, who, 
Let's see if it has the date it was published. 2001. Okay, well, then that means I might be wrong. Oh, yeah. I could be wrong. I'm pretty sure, I, I, anyway, it was released as kind of like a standalone single and it was, you know, they used to put on greatest hits compilations, new release songs as a kind of way to entice fans to buy the whole collection. Even if they had all the other songs, they didn't have the new song. Um, and yeah, it has Killer Mike from um, Run The Jewels. Anyway, so I got that for a dollar, and you can see the condition of the booklet's fine. The case is cracked and is missing a hinge, but that is to be expected. Um, the disc I didn't look at, but let's look at it right now. Here's what the disc looks like. That's a little bit um, slightly R-rated. Probably wouldn't show that to my son. It... Oh, it's a little bit smudgy and there's a few scratches on it, but it's, it's less scratches, more smudges. I'm sure it will play absolutely fine because I've seen things in much, much, much worse condition play fine. So, yeah. So, anyway, there's the first thing I got for a dollar. Outcast, Big Boy, Dre Present. Kind of greatest hits, I think. The next two are these old style double discs that were the norm in the 80s and 90s when you had a double or even a triple album disc. Um, they would use these fatter, sturdier uh, contraptions as opposed to the what they did later on, which is where they used one of these style and just had the kind of the flippy thing inside it that was prone to breaking very easily. <clears throat> Beastie Boys Anthology, The Sounds of Science. This came out, I remember, in 1999. You can see the person who originally bought this, bought this in Britain. <clears throat> it's interesting. From HMV. We used to have HMV in New Zealand as well for £13.99, pence, which is about, in today's, well, not in today's money. If it's a direct, uh, what do you call it? Conversion, currency conversion in current exchange rate, it would be about... 28 New Zealand dollars. However, this was bought almost 25 years ago. And so it probably, in today's money, would be closer to kind of like 40 to $50 with inflation and whatnot. There's a, a young, young Beastie Boys. I don't know if those are real. Oh, they probably are real photos. Maybe the kind of uh, Photoshop together. <clears throat> But yes, this is an anthology of their, obviously, first, what, one, two, three, four, four or five albums. Oh, here we go. Now, I used to be, oh, that's thick, man. That's like a bloody novel. Uh, I used to be a pretty huge Beastie Boys fan. Around the period of um, Ill Communication and Hello Nasty. I think I've done a video on Hello Nasty, like a year ago, a year and a half ago. Uh, in that period, um, they were one of my favorite bands. And um, those two albums especially, I listened to a lot. You know, Hello, Hello Nasty came out in 98. So it was really, um, I was at the kind of perfect age to really enjoy that album. Then afterwards, I went back and listened to their older stuff like License to Ill, Paul's Boutique, Check Your Head. To be honest, License to Ill, even though I know that's kind of considered a classic and it's a little bit um, dated and not really my thing, Paul's Boutique is kind of considered one of their classics um, and it's got some great songs on it. Check Your Head I really like a lot. Ill Communication is a classic. Like I just said, Hello Nasty. And so up to that, po that point, and then they had a few kind of uh, compilations, like they had, uh, anyway. Um, <clears throat> this, I guess, kind of puts together those, they say anthology, and in my man, anthology, when I think of anthology, I think of the Beatles anthology, which was more of a, um, not just the songs, but kind of different, like demo versions or different studio versions, but that isn't always what anthology means. Sometimes anthology just means like a greatest hits collection. 
here are some of the um, <clears throat> artwork from maybe some of the singles, I assume. Intergalactic, Sabotage, that's from Paul's Boutique, obviously, Remote Control. There's an EP, Polywog Stew. Now, some of the really early stuff, this is pre-licensed deal, Egg Raid on Mojo. Um, that's the one from Same Old Shit, I think is what it's called. It's the one with the dog on the front cover. Does it say on here? And that was when they were still like a punk band, you know? Um, a hardcore kind of or influenced by hardcore punk New York early 80s type stuff but <clears throat> it's a little bit too raw and I didn't think anything it was anything special at all when I heard I think I've listened to that once or one or two times in my life my life that um, same old shit uh, which the air raid on Mojo's from And then they're talking about um, Polywog Stew there. Came out of the band called The Young and the Useless. I listened to Polywog Stew. It was definitely the best New York hardcore record to come out, was it? No, probably Polywog Stew. Anyway. And then progressively they got <clears throat> more influenced by hip hop, which was obviously kind of in its very early stages in New York City at that time. And they um, toured together with Run DMC. But <clears throat> for what I'm read, what I've read, and also I've half listened to the book they put out a few years ago. It was more than a few years ago now. Probably close to 10 years, but uh, no, it wasn't 10. Whatever. They put out about 2016, I think. And um, it sounded like, and from what other people have said as well, they were almost doing the hip-hop thing as like a joke. As like a, not mocking, but kind of like, not a hundred percent serious, but that's what caught on. Obviously, license to ill and fight for your right to party and all that stuff caught on, and so they went with that, and then kind of went more deeply into it in a more respectful way, perhaps afterwards. <clears throat> um, anyway, this booklet just goes through obviously the different eras. Fight for your right to party era. That looks like it's getting towards Paul's Boutique era. Yep. And, um, not ad, yeah, MCA is getting a beard. Hey, ladies. That's from Paul's Boutique. <clears throat> then I think they, um, <clears throat> they, um, they moved to LA for check your head I think both check your head and actually I don't know I'm going to say something here that's so I'm completely wrong I was going to say check your head and, and ill communication of both um, West Coast recorded albums when they were living in Los Angeles and then they went back to New York for um, Hello Nasty could be wrong on that <clears throat> so watch your watch your watch your one so the members of the band there are giving a little uh, spiel about each song, which should be interesting to read. <clears throat> and now we're getting to uh, Ill Communication, Root Down, Get It Together, which was with Q-Tip from Tribe Called Quest. It's a great song. <clears throat> and then obviously they go up towards... <clears throat> Sorry, my throat... Hello Nasty. So that looks, and then Alive, as I was just saying there about putting on new songs onto Grace Hits collections as a way to kind of entice fans to buy it. Alive was the song that they put on to this, which was the new song, record, I guess recorded especially for it. And quite a good song. I, I always liked Alive. Some good lines in it, some good uh, lyrical lines. Talk about, uh, they call it goatee metal rap, where is it? Goatee metal rap can say good night, meaning new metal, because this was recorded in 99, which was when new metal was kind of right at the starting of its, of its ascent. 
I shine on the mic like ultra bright, create a monster with these rhymes I write. Goatee metal rap, please say good night. So yeah, he's meaning <laughs> new metal because a lot of guys, those like Fred Durst or whoever else, had a goatee. So they call it, he called it goatee metal rap. <clears throat> That's the other one. Now you can shuffle numbers, but facts is facts. So many billionaires while so many lack. So before the poor decide to react, come on, party people, share up your stack. Um. <clears throat> So the booklet in very good condition. The discs also, I got something stuck to it, like a bit of uh, dust or grime. I'll try and get it off, but it no scratches that I can see. Put out on Grand Royal, which is an imprint, their own imprint on Capitol Records. So they released some. Oh, there's a second bloody booklet. Jeez. Okay, this is all their releases. <clears throat> was this all the singles as well as the albums? I guess. A same old bullshit. I said same old shit, didn't I? So, um, yes, this is the singles as well as the albums. But it's not and doesn't appear to be any kind of chronological order that I can see. Um, that one down there, the sound... The in sound from way out. I showed that when I bought it probably about a year ago. I've also got the Root Down EP, which has got a few different remix versions of, of Root Down. One of which I really like. I think it's the third one. Don't know who did it, but um, usually I'm not a big remix person. But And also, obviously, the album's Hello Nasty. Got that. Um, <clears throat> what was I saying? Oh, that's right, Grand Royal. They put out a few other artists on Grand Royal. I guess, um, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. I actually, they put out Luscious Jackson, which features Kate Schellenbeck, I think is her name. I actually mentioned it in that book that I saw it. She was the drummer, I think, in one of the very, very early iterations of the Beastie Boys, or maybe that, that hardcore band before the Beastie Boys, the Air Grader or Mojo era. Um, she was in that band, and then she obviously left, and they went in their direction, and she went in different bands and then she formed Luscious Jackson and they were kind of around in that 90s alternative scene kind of not so much grunge but their most famous song is probably Naked Eye which was their most famous song their biggest commercial hit was probably Naked Eye which came out in the late early in late 90s quite a good song I'm pretty sure that was put out on Crown Royal Crown Royal Grand Royal get it right Grand Royal. <clears throat> um, so yeah, for a dollar, I thought she'd charge me two dollars for that because it's a double disc, but she only charged me a dollar. Pink Floyd, Delicate Sound of Thunder. Now I've seen, I've seen this cover and remember it since I was a kid. Now when did this come out? I would guess about 87, 88. Came out in 88. So I would have been about six or seven years old when this came out and I just have many memory not specific memories but just i've seen this album cover so many times in shops when i was a kid and in magazines and things like that i'm pretty sure it's an album cover done by storm what's his name thorgenson or thornson i've talked to him before he did a lot of the pink floyd albums also did that audio slave album um their first one and a few other bands had a very kind of recognizable style um, and this, I believe, is a live album of the Gilmore era. This is post um, Roger Waters leaving, obviously. This is 88, so Roger Waters, the whole thing broke apart in, what, 84, 85? Maybe it was earlier than that, actually. The Wall came out in 1980, and I think the final cut was 83. Could be wrong on that. Could have been early, could have been 81 actually. But in that kind of first half of the 80s, they battled. And then Gilmore won the right to continue using the name. Rightly or wrongly. And um, and he went on to, I guess, what was the first album after that? Uh, the, um, geez, what's it called? The one with Learning to Fly on it. The word that keeps coming to my, to my mouth is comfortably numb. It's obviously not fucking comfortably numb. It's 
Momentary Lapse of Reason. Momentary Lapse of Reason, which I think that came out in 87. And then this came out in 88. So obviously Gilmore, Nick Mason is still drumming. And I'm pretty sure Rick Wright, yep, Rick Wright was the keyboardist. And um, I think Guy Pratt, I don't, know, I don't know if that is Guy Pratt, but I'm pretty sure Guy Pratt was the bassist. If you watch <coughs> um, any of the concert footage of the Gilmore era, like Pulse, which I guess is probably one of the most famous live concerts they, they've released, Pink Floyd, Guy Pratt is... Um, is playing bass and also doing the kind of backing vocals and the like in um I think he does Ro Roger Waters vocals parts as well sometimes like in um Run Like Hell you know how it's kind of like a <coughs> a, a call and not a call and response but it's a two part vocal there's Gilmore sings a line and then Roger Waters sings a line well Guy Pratt does the Roger Waters part in that at least and Guy Pratt I'm pretty sure went on to marry David Gilmour's daughter. Could be wrong in that, because, you know, I say a lot of things on those these videos, and a lot of it's just from memory of something I read fleetingly on Wikipedia years ago or in a magazine even longer ago, and I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that is the case. Now, I know they came to New Zealand. They toured, obviously, I was a little kid. They toured um, New Zealand in this period, and I'm pretty sure my brother, my oldest brother, who's quite a lot older than me, he's 13 years older than me, he um, saw them play. Yes, I was right, Storm Thorgensen did the art on the cover. Produced by David Gilmore, Mixed Abbey Road. Um, special thanks to Bob Ezrin. Uh, I'm trying to see if they mention specifically the the players because they they also they had more than um like i said tour personnel but that could be all like the the fucking um the roadies and shit and where does it would say like the actual members of the band that i i here we go i went completely past it <clears throat> dave gilmore nick mason richard wright john karen never heard of him tim renwick guy pratt i did mention None of those other names stuck out to me at all. Guy, Gary Wallace, Scott Page, Tim Renwick, and the three backing vocalists, Margaret, Rachel, and Durga. Anyway, um, I kind of almost just bought this because A, it's Pink Floyd, and, you know, there's a Pink Floyd album I don't have. And to be honest, I've owned a lot of Pink Floyd albums off and on over my life, and I've shown some of them on this channel I've bought and sold them and sold them again. I've never owned this one. And um, live albums aren't really something I would typically buy. But it was a dollar. And it's, like I said, that cover is so iconic for me, personally, that, um, yeah. So 15, 15 classics. So let's see, what do they choose to play? <clears throat> Shining a Crazy Diamond. Okay, so we got... Water, uh, let's say Waters era, Learning to Fly, Gilmore era. Here's another movie, Round and Round, Round and Around, Sorrow, The Dogs of War, On the Turning Away. That's another Gilmore era. These days, time, wish you were here, us and them, money, another brick in the wall, come to be them. Run like hell. So they kind of, yeah, give uh, a little bit from different eras, I guess. So yeah, a dollar. Never thought I'd find this, to be honest, in a second-hand shop. Not that I was kind of in my mind, but nonetheless. And lastly, something I have not bought for 13 years. What's this? Yeah, maybe 12 years. A DVD. <clears throat> now, you know, DVDs, I, I, I never look at the DVD section in the second-hand places. Which maybe is a mistake because so, sometimes you walk past and you do kind of see, and it was, it's not, like I said, that's tw 12 years ago. I would have been so much more into buying DVDs, but I don't even have anything that can play a DVD. But I do have a residual DVD collection, just like I sold off so many of my CDs. Well, I sold off 
basically all my DVDs. I've kept a few. Um, some of them like music. Uh, actually, I should show them one day. Music type ones. Like I've got a Dream Theater concert DVD. I think Live at the Budokan. Um, I've got the Dig documentary, the Brian Jonestown Massacre and Danny Warhol's on, on DVD. Um, I, I can't remember, but I've, I've kept a few of them. But I haven't watched them for over a decade because I don't have a DVD player. I used to have a PlayStation console which could play DVDs, but I don't even have that anymore. But my plan is eventually to buy a DVD player of some sort to be able to play them. And this is a movie that I've seen a few times and I really, really like a lot. If you don't know, this is a, not really a biopic, but it's a, a based on a true story about Joy Division and specifically Ian Curtis. So it's called Control by Anton Corbin, who is the, I guess, is a famous uh, photographer um, who... It's kind of fate and known for photography, for, for the photo, photographing, photographing uh, bands and specifically Joy Division. Now I remember when this came out. I saw it pretty soon after it came out, and I was um, quite blown away by it. I, it really impressed me. And obviously, the other movie that kind of Joy Division focus uh, is is part of a little bit is. Um, 24 hour party people, which is more of a, a focus on Tony Wilson, the um, factory records guy, and all the bands that surrounded that, like Happy Mondays and New Order. And, but Joy Division and N. Curtis were in that a little bit. Uh, but this one is solely about Joy Division. And like I said, with a primary focus on N. Curtis. It's filmed in black and white. <clears throat> um, it. has a few great scenes some of them quite unintentionally funny the, 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 the ones that I remember are the the part where he's on at a concert and he doesn't want to go on he has kind of like a, an anxiety attack or something like that and he can't go on stage and so their um, their manager what's his name Rob something Rob can't remember his name Rob something he, he like it's like, oh, okay, well, you know, he's like, doesn't want to say, get on stage, you fucker. But he, he basically, you can see he's thinking that. But in an emergency situation, he gives money to some random guy in another band to go on there and sing for Joy Division. So sing it in, in Curtis's place. And so this random guy walks on sta stage and starts singing or tries to sing. And the, band, the crowd goes nuts and starts throwing bottles at him. And so they see that reaction and, and Ian Curtis feels like guilty. So he tries to go and he goes on, but he lasts about 30 seconds and he like has to walk off stage again. And so then the other guy goes back on again and again, the crowd goes nuts and kind of like throws shit and basically storms the stage. And uh, the other one is when Ian Curtis turns up, this is towards the end of the movie, turns up at the manager's house with his girlfriend. He's, he's married but he also has a girlfriend. I think her name's Anik. And when he turns up, the manager says, uh, I always remember this line, shine a light. But it says it in a, a very thick northern accent. And you know, they're from Manchester. Shine a light. Which I think means shite. Ah, oh, shite. Ah, oh, shine a light. Like, oh, fuck me, basically. Um, <clears throat> but a great movie. So, for a dollar... I thought I'd get it and just hang on to it because if I, you know, I guess I could just download it. I don't know. It's a movie I like so much about a band that I love so much that it's kind of one of those few that I would like to have and keep physically. But this is not, uh, certainly not going to be the start of me buying DVDs. It was just, it was literally sitting on top of the stack of DVDs next to the CD shelves. So I just thought, oh. So I grabbed it. And that was a dollar also. So four dollars. Pretty great bargain, I reckon. Um, especially after not looking for so long. So yeah, almost half an hour of yapping. But we'll leave it there. Thanks for watching.